Hola. Uh, that's loud. Hola, buenos días. Estoy muy feliz de estar aquí con ustedes en esta muy hermosa ciudad de Puebla. Gracias. Y pues. Just over a year ago, and for the third time in my life, I ceased to exist. I was having a small operation, and my brain was filling with anesthetic. And I remember sensations of blackness and detachment and falling apart. And then I was back. I was drowsy and disoriented, but definitely there. Now, when you wake up from a deep sleep, you might be confused about the time, or anxious about oversleeping, especially if you've got jet lag, something like that, like I do. But coming around from general anesthesia is very different. I could have been under for five minutes, five hours, five years, or even 50 years. I just wasn't there. Total oblivion, olvido total. Anesthesia is a modern kind of magic. It turns people into objects and back again into people. And in this process lies one of the greatest mysteries in science and philosophy: How does consciousness happen? Somehow. Within each of our brains, the combined activity of many billions of neurons, each one a tiny biological machine, is giving rise to a conscious experience, and not just any conscious experience, your conscious experience right here and right now. How does this happen? Now, you might have heard that we know nothing about how the brain and body give rise to consciousness. That there is this uncrossable explanatory gap between the physical world and the world of our conscious lives. Some people even say that consciousness is beyond the reach of science altogether. But in fact, the last 25 years has seen an explosion of work in this area. If you come to David's lab or my lab at the University of Sussex, you'll find scientists from all different disciplines, and also philosophers. All of us trying to understand how consciousness happens and what happens when it goes wrong. And the strategy that we take is very simple. I'd like you to think about consciousness. In the same way that we've come to think about life. Now, not so long ago, people thought life could never be explained by physics and chemistry. That life had to be more than just mechanism. But as biologists got on with the job of explaining the properties of living systems—metabolism, reproduction, homeostasis, and so on—in terms of things happening inside brains and bodies, the basic mystery of what life is started to fade away. Life is magical, but there's nothing magic about life. And as with life, so with consciousness. Once we start to explain its properties in terms of things happening inside brains and bodies, the basic mystery of what consciousness is should start to fade away. At least that's that's the plan. So, what are the properties of consciousness? What should a science of consciousness try to explain? Well, there are experiences of the world around us, full of sights, sounds, and smells. This. Panoramic, three-dimensional, fully immersive inner universe that we all inhabit, and then there's conscious self—the specific experience of being you or of being me, the experience of being the subject of experience. And this is possibly the aspect of consciousness that we cling to most tightly. So let's start with experiences of the world around us, and with the idea of the brain as a prediction engine. So imagine. Being a brain, just as David was saying, there you are. You're a brain. You're locked inside a bony skull,、uh, without any direct access to things out there in the world, whatever they may be. All the brain gets are these ambiguous, noisy sensory signals, which are only indirectly related to the external world. There's no light in the skull, and there's no sound either. So perception has to be this process of informed guesswork, in which these sensory signals are combined. With the brain's prior expectations or beliefs about the way the world is, to come up with its best guess of the causes of those sensory signals, and that's what we perceive—the brain's best guess of what's out there. Let me give you a couple of examples to, to make this clear. Now, you might have seen this illusion before, but I'd like you to think about it in a slightly different way. If you look at the two patches A and B there. Now they should look to you to be very different shades of grey. Does everybody see that? That they're different shades of grey. Yeah, good. Of course, the reason I'm showing it to you is because they're exactly the same shade of grey, and I can show you that if I put up a second version, I've joined the two patches together. You can see it's one continuous、um, shade of grey. If you still don't believe me, I'll move that bar across, and you can see there's no division at all. It's just a single shade of grey. Take it away. Looks different again. What's going on here is that the brain is using its prior knowledge built deep into the circuits of the visual cortex. 
that a cast shadow dims the appearance of a surface so that we see B as lighter than it really is. Here's another example um, which shows just how quickly the brain can use new information to change cons conscious perception. If you look at this, uh, this image here, you'll probably just see a bunch of black and white patches right, with no particular meaning at all. But if I fill it in, you'll see that there's, in fact, an image there. There's a woman and a horse, and the woman's wearing a hat. And it's, you know, it's, it's a meaningful image. Now, if you look at this for a while, I won't leave it up for too long, but if you just keep looking at it and I take it away, back to the first image, you should still be able to see objects where previously there were just black and white patches. And what's remarkable here is that the sensory information coming into your brain hasn't changed at all. All that's changed is your brain's best guess of the cause of that information, and that changes what you consciously perceive. So all this puts the brain basis of perception in rather a different light. I mean, we tend to think of perception as this process in which sensory signals come from the outside world and percolate deeper and deeper into the brain with more sophisticated processing at every level. Perception is this kind of outside, in or bottom-up process. The prediction engine view turns us around, and it suggests that perception depends just as much, if not more, on perceptual predictions flowing in the opposite direction, from the top-down or the inside-out, you know, the world we experience comes just as much from the inside out as the outside in. We don't just passively perceive our worlds, we actively generate them. Here's one last example of perception as this constructive and generative process. Uh, in this panoramic video, which you'd normally watch through a, through a head-mounted display of an HMD, um, the world, which in this case is the campus of my University of Sussex, has been transformed into a psychedelic playground. And what we've done, we've processed this footage using an algorithm based on deep dreams to simulate what would happen if the brain had overly strong perceptual predictions to see dogs everywhere. Uh, and, and as you can see, the results are rather strange. And they, they simulate what might happen in various kinds of altered states of perception, like various kinds of hallucination, or perhaps even under some kind of pharmacological conditions. Uh, you know, our campus doesn't normally look exactly like that, um, though it looks quite close sometimes. So think about this for a minute. You know, if hallucinations are a kind of uncontrolled perception, then normal perception right here and right now is also a kind of hallucination, but it's a controlled hallucination in which the brain's perceptual predictions are continually being reined in by sensory signals coming from the world. In fact, you could say that we're all hallucinating all the time. It's just that whenever we agree about our hallucinations, well, that's what we call reality. Now I'm going to suggest to you that your experiences of being a self, well, that's also a kind of controlled hallucination. And you know, this seems rather strange to start with, because it's one thing that my eyes might be deceived about what's out there, but how can I be deceived about what it is to be me? You know, the experience of being a self, for most of us, seems so unified, so continuous, and so familiar, that it's very hard not to take it for granted. But we shouldn't take it for granted. There are many different ways in which we experience being a self. There's the bodily self. This is the experience of having a particular body in the world and of being a body. There are experiences of experiencing the world from a particular first-person point of view, usually somewhere just behind my eyes. There are experiences of intending to do things and of being the cause of things that happen. When people talk about free will, this is usually what they're talking about. And finally, there are experiences of being a continuous and distinctive person over time, built from a rich set of memories and social interactions. Now, for most of us, most of the time, all these aspects of being a self are bound together. We don't experience them as being separable, but many experiments show, and psychiatrists and neurologists know very well, that these different aspects of being a self can fall apart in all sorts of different ways. What that means is that the basic background experience of being a self, being you or being me, is another fragile construction of the brain, another experience which, like all others, requires explanation. So let's return to the bodily self. How does the brain generate the experience of having and of being a particular body? Well, the idea is just the same principles apply. The brain makes its best guess about what is, 
and what is not part of its body. And there's a, a beautiful experiment which illustrates this. Um, and unlike most experiments in neuroscience, this is one you can, you can do at home. All you need is a, a kind of fake hand and a couple of paintbrushes. Now, in the rubber hand illusion, which is about 20 years old now, um, a person sits down by a table, their real hand is hidden, and a fake hand, this rubber hand, is placed in front of them. Then both hands are simultaneously stroked with a paintbrush while the person looks at the fake hand. And after a while, for most people, this leads to the very strange experience that the fake hand is somehow part of their body. And the idea is that this congruence between seeing touch and feeling touch on an object that looks like a hand and is roughly where a hand should be is enough evidence that the fake hand is, in fact, part of the person's body. Now, you can test this by measuring all kinds of clever things like skin conductance and um, <laughs> heart rate. But that's definitely the most fun way to test whether it works or not. And it's pretty clear, you know, you can see the guy in blue has assimilated the fake hand to be part of his body. And indeed, if you threaten the hand without actually stabbing it, you do see all these physiological responses that you don't see if you just put a hand in front without that induction phase. Now, you can extend this principle to the entire body. This is a, something we set up at the British Science Festival in Brighton, where I live, a few weeks ago. This is called the body swap illusion. Here, two people wear headsets with cameras on the front, and you swap the feeds so that one person sees themselves through the other person's eyes, if you like, and then they shake hands with each other, which gives this really important multisensory stimulation. And by doing this, you can give somebody the very strange experience that they are shaking hands with themselves from the outside. And there's an important lesson here, which is that when people report things like out-of-body experiences, which is a very common thing people have reported throughout history in spiritual or perhaps traumatic situations, we should take very seriously that they have these experiences, even if we can remain skeptical about what they conclude from them. Having an out-of-body experience doesn't mean that your soul or your consciousness has literally left your skull and has gone flying around somewhere. All it means is that your brain has reached an unusual best guess about where your first-person perspective is located. So these kinds of experiments, and there are many more I could show you, they all point to the idea that experiences of what our body is and where it is in space are just different kinds of controlled hallucinations generated by the brain. But that's not all. As well as perceiving the body as an object in the world from the outside, we also perceive it from within. In fact, a great deal of neuronal real estate is devoted to processing sensory signals coming from deep inside the body. And these sensory signals, which we collectively call interoception, report things like blood pressure levels, how the heart is doing, what the gut is like, and so on. These are critically important because it's perception and regulation of the interior of the body. Well, that's what keeps us alive. And you know, think about it. The purpose of the brain is not to figure things out or have complex thoughts or, or um, rich experience. It's to keep you alive. That's the primary purpose that brains evolve for, to keep going. Here's another version of the rubber hand illusion. This is from our lab at Sussex. And in this case, people wear a head-mounted display, and they uh, experience a virtual hand which flashes to red and back, either in time or out of time, with their heartbeat. And it turns out that when the fake hand is flashing in time with their heartbeat, they have a stronger sense that it is part of their body. So what this means is that basic experiences of being a self depend on sensory signals coming from both outside and deep inside the body. Conscious selfhood is a deeply embodied phenomenon. Now, there's one last thing I want to draw your attention to about all this, which is that when I experience the world around me, it seems full of objects. It seems full of people, chairs, and the spaces between them. But my experience of the body from within isn't like that at all. I don't experience my, my kidneys somewhere, my spleen somewhere, my liver somewhere else. I don't experience my insides as objects. In fact, I don't experience them much at all, unless they go wrong. And here's the key. Perception of the body from within isn't about figuring out what's there. It's about control and regulation. It's about keeping critical physiological quantities within the tight bounds that are compatible with staying alive. So when the brain uses perception to figure out what's there, 
we experience objects as the causes of our sensation. That explains what our, the phenomenology of the outside world is like. But when the brain uses predictions to control or to regulate, we experience how well or how badly that control is going. And that has something, I think, to do with why you know, the experience of an emotion or a mood is very different from an experience of a coffee cup on a table. There are different kinds of perceptual predictions, different kinds of controlled hallucinations. And if you take this idea all the way through, you can start to see that all of our experiences, since they all depend on this same principles of prediction, all stem from this basic physiological drive to stay alive. We experience the self and the world with, through, and because of our living bodies. Let me bring things together, step by step. What we consciously perceive is shaped by and depends on the brain's best guess of what's out there. The rubber hand illusion shows that this applies also to our experiences of what is and what is not our body. Experiences of selfhood depend critically on sensory signals coming from inside the body. And finally, these basic experiences of being an embodied self have more to do with control, regulation, with staying alive, than with figuring out what's there. So our experiences of the world around us and of ourselves within it are both kinds of controlled hallucinations designed by evolution over millions of years to keep us alive in worlds full of danger and opportunity. I'll leave you with three implications of all this. The first is that just as we can misperceive the world, we can misperceive ourselves, miscontrol ourselves, when the predictive machinery of perception goes wrong. And understanding this opens many new opportunities in psychiatry and neurology, because we can now finally start understanding and getting at the mechanisms, rather than just treating the symptoms when it comes to distressing conditions like psychosis, schizophrenia, and Tourette syndrome. And these are the conditions that we're working on in our lab at Sussex. Second implication is that our conscious experiences are very, very deeply grounded in the basic biological life processes that keep us alive. Um, we are flesh and blood animals. So this means that our conscious experiences cannot be reduced to or uploaded to a software program running on an advanced robot, however sophisticated or smart. Consciousness and intelligence are very different things. Just making computers smarter is not going to make them sentient. And finally, our own individual way of being conscious is just one point in a vast space of possible consciousnesses. And even human consciousness generally is just a tiny region and a vast, rate, vast possibility of different ways of being a self. Our individual world is distinctive for each of us, but it's, they're all based on the same principles of prediction shared by many other living creatures. Now, these are but quite significant changes in how we understand ourselves. And I think they should be celebrated, because as so often in science, with whether it's Copernicus, we're not at the center of the universe, to Darwin, we're related to all other creatures, with a, and even to the present day with neuroscience, with a greater understanding comes a greater sense of wonder and a greater realization that we are part of and not apart from the rest of nature. And when the end of consciousness comes, the author Julian Barnes put it best. He said, there is nothing to be afraid of, nothing at all. Thank you. Thank you.